Okay, you can start. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased and honored to announce the Oliver Lonas Mamero Prize Award 2020 to you. This prize initially started in 2004 is a tribute to the uh, founder of strong Finnish tradition in low temperature physics. And this prize is awarded every fourth year for outstanding contributions to low temperature physics and related fields. Since 2016, Blue Force Cryogenics has been the main sponsor of the prize. This support is very valuable for us because it allows us really to continue this prize in the future. Here you can see the panel, evaluation panel. It consisted besides me as the chairman, eight international uh, highly visible scientists and one member from Blue Force Limited. I wish to thank all of the members of the evaluation committee for their work. They, had, they have done extremely good job. Initially, we had 13 candidates out of which we selected, voted three to the second round. And uh, the second round of votes was extremely tight. The recipient of Olli Velonas Mamero Prize 2020, Seamus Davis, for his pioneering investigations and applications of exquisite scanning probe techniques for visualization of electronic quantum matter at atomic scale. Now, before we let uh, uh, Seamus to give his presentation, I wish to say a few words about his background, his career, and, and his work. Seamus started at Berkeley with Richard Packard, where he did his PhD in, in 1989. Then he continued as a postdoc at Berkeley for two years. And then after that, in 1993, he was appointed a professor of physics at, at Berkeley. There he stayed till 2003 or to end of 2002. And 2003, he started as a professor of physics at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. In 2018, Seamus retired from, from Cornell. And nowadays, he has three different affiliations. So J, J, G, G, sorry, J. G. White, Distinguished Professor Emeritus at Cornell University, Professor of Quantum Physics at University College Cork, Ireland, and Professor of Physics, University of Oxford, UK. The list of recognition of, of Seamus is, is very long. I only have picked up a few things. So in, in, in 1994, he got the Packard Fellowship in Science and Engineering. This is a very nice uh, fellowship for a young faculty member. It's nowadays about $1 million and it comes uh, with no strings attached. In 2005, Seamus was uh, elected as the fellow of the American Physical Society. So he was already very well established in, in 2005. Also 2005, he received Fritz London Memorial Prize, which many people view is the highest prize that, that one can get in low physics. In 2009, he received the Kameling Ons Prize, which is a very prominent prize in superconductivity. As a member of US National Academy of Sciences, he was elected in 2010. Now, uh, Seamus started his career with, with helium 3 superfluid, with Richard Packard, and, and the main goal they had was to demonstrate just an effect in superfluids and also show that it can be used for various applications. So you, you all know well the, the Josephson relation where the Josephson frequency is related to the voltage. Now in, in superfluids, it's related with the pressure. So in, in superfluids, 
the, the weak link is a, a small hole in the diaphragm. So if, if you have a small uh, hole and you push liquid with constant uh, uh, force, you have a diaphragm and, and, and you push that with a constant force, then the flow through this orifice, it will oscillate with time. And this is what, what uh, Shemus and, and Richard Packer saw back in 1997. So they could see the just oscillation, oscillation frequency at 273 hertz. Now, if you then take two of these small holes on, or arrays of holes, if you wish, then you can build a, a, a DC squid. In superconductivity, this is used for measuring magnetic field, but in superfluids, this is uh, sensitive to rotation. And these concepts were used by, by uh, Shemus and, and, and Packard. They built a, a system uh, shown here. There is a loop. So this is the loop that picks up rotation. And they could use this setup to demonstrate the influence of, of Earth's rotation to the superfluid. So they were able to measure the rotation of the Earth using this helium-3 squid. This is, is very interesting because one question is, what is the frame, reference frame, where the superfluid is at, at rest? So there are various uh, ideas about using this in, in cosmological experiments. But it's still unclear how far one can get with those experiments. This picture illustrates grad student life at Berkeley in the mid of 80s. So Seamus was a racing uh, group member on, on the uh, sailing boat of Richard Packard. Also, uh, Catherine Selby, the lady on the left, she was a member and, and she is the wife of Seamus. And, and this third person here is, is a friend of Richard Packard. Now, with the uh, experiments of, on superfluid gyroscopes, one of the problems is vibrations. Now, on the left, you can see the setting that was used in Paris in Saclay. There's a huge concrete block which is isolated by polyurethane foam from the ground. And then on top of that, one has big air springs which are supporting a 15 ton table. And then the whole setup, the experiment is built on, on, on this platform. Seamus, he developed this further for his STM work. So he now, instead of polyurethane foam, he used air springs also for the lower frame, which is now 50 ton of concrete. And then there's a second platform lead filled table again on, on uh, air springs. And also Shemus added more isolation for acoustics. So he really made a system which doesn't have any vibrations in it. So basically he took the, the schemes from, from superfluid work and applied that to the STM. And here I, I want to quote uh, Shemus in an interview, he said that if you build your own apparatus, then it's more likely that you find something interesting. And this was also a motto of, of Olli Lonasma. So in that sense, I think it's very appropriate that Seamus was elected as the RD of this year's prize. Here you can see the setup at Cornell. You can see the support structure, the heavy platform here, the cryostat. And if I understood now correctly, then all what you see is sitting on a set of air springs. With these uh, extremely uh, quiet setups, Jemus has done lots of discoveries using STM. I only mentioned one highlight quasi-particle interference imaging. So here you can see a, a set of, of STM images taken at, at different 
biases at different energies. And by analyzing these images using the, the band structure of this material, there's now bismuth, strontium, calcium, copper oxide. So using the band structure and the putative gap structure, Samush was able to explain all the features of these pictures without the need of having uh, some additional order parameter in, in the system, as was assumed earlier. This scheme, quasi-particle interference imaging, this has now been used on, on, on various fields, in, in various correlated materials. On the left, you can see the uh, first STM that Shemus built. It's from different angles. So this was built in Berkeley and, and then taken to Cornell. And on the right, you can see Shemus at the time when, when these devices were built. In 2003, Shemus started at Cornell. And, and partly, Cornell hired him to do helium-3 work. So he, uh, Cornell is very famous for helium-3 work. The uh, trio, Lee, Osha, Richardson, they got the Nobel Prize in 96 for the helium-3 superfluid work. And Jemus was interested in, in, in the superfluid work and when, in 2004, Kim and Chan, they, they found evidence of, of super solid, so crystal, which has also superfluid properties. So Shemus and other guys at Cornell, they got interested in, in superfluid experiments. And using torsion oscillator work, they made very important contributions in this field, and here, is, is one setup, torsion oscillator, which was used to measure the temperature dependence of the frequency and dissipation. So by analyzing this behavior, in particular, how the system relaxes from a non equilibrium state, Shemus was able to claim that the system is not really super solid, it's more like amorphous solid. This work was published in 2009 in Science, and this was one of the the nails that pinned ultimately that, that no super solid was discovered in, in healing four crystals. Before I finish, I, I want to point out that Seamus has been very successful in uh, educating, training future uh, people into academia. So here is a list of, of 20 people who have a professor position all over the world. I'm really impressed by this amount of, of people. Maybe one of the secrets is, is the place where, where Seamus is, is presently living. This picture, in, the scenery is, is from that place. It's West Cork Island. With this, picture which was taken after or during a, a, a celebration party. It was after a, a yacht sailing season. I wish to congratulate you once again, Seamus. And also I want to thank Kathy Selby and Richard Packard for the photos and, and you all for your attention. Okay, thank you so much, Bertie. So, uh, congratulations, Shimus. And uh, well, just uh, it, it, when Bertie contacted us, it was really, we immediately saw that it was a great opportunity to have someone so important in cryogenics here, and particularly these words like, if you do your own experiment, you'll do that better. So, I guess now the best is that we hear to Shimus. Thank you so much. Okay, great. Um, it's wonderful to be here. It's an amazing conference. Um, unique, um, unprecedented. Um, I
I hope many conferences in the future turn out like this one. So I'm delighted to be here and make a contribution. Um, thank you very much to Professor Hakkinen for his um, introduction and I'm extremely grateful to the committee uh, for the Lunaspa Prize, also to Alto University and Blue Force uh, for the honor that they've given me by awarding this prize this year. Um, it's a tremendous honor to join the group of colleagues um, who are members uh, of the Lunaspa Prize Award group. I'll say a few words about uh, Oli myself at the end of this talk. Um, but I propose to dive right into research now and give you a feeling for uh, where we are in our research program and uh, what we would like to do um, using our new techniques. So um, I want to talk about a new quantum microscope and its ability to visualize things which haven't been seen before and which are extremely interesting. Uh, there's a team of colleagues um, who work on these projects. Uh, most recently, Steve Edkins and Mohamed Hamidian working on the cuprates, Zhao Liang Yu and Yi Che Chang working on transition metal dichalcogenides. And then uh, my long term collaborator is shown here, long term theory and strategic collaborators as shown along the bottom of this figure. I thank them all, and it's a privilege for me to represent them um, at this occasion. So let's talk about superfluids and their quasiparticles. So in our universe, there are particles. Um, they're the ones which make the nuclei, atoms, molecules that make the condensed matter that we all love so well. These objects have masses, otherwise they wouldn't have any bound states and we would have no uh, condensed matter physics to work on. But where does that mass come from? Let's say for quarks and electrons, probably also for neutrinos. Where does the mass come from? Well, starting in 1962, Phil Anderson proposed that um, um, gauge bosons uh, receive their mass by their interaction with a superfluid. So the gauge bosons of the electromagnetic field, photons, would receive their mass by interacting with a superfluid uh, of electrically charged particles. And very quickly, his idea, so he worked this out for um, U1 non-relativistic theory of superconductivity, but very quickly, this was picked up by high energy physicists, Engler, Groot, Higgs, Tom Kibble, and they worked it out for um, SU2, uh, um, Lorentz invariant um, version of the weak interaction for high, for high energy physics. So these theories, which are now usually just called Higgs theory, although there are many people involved, uh, they postulate that the mass of the particles in our universe is coming from the Higgs field. The Higgs field is a superfluid that fills our universe. It's got spin zero and weak interaction hypercharge, y equals a half. That's the hypothesis. I mean, for many decades, this was merely a hypothesis. And you could ask, why should one believe such a really amazing idea? The universe is full of a weak superfluid. Well, as Higgs pointed out, one test would be that there's a quasiparticle, which should exist. If this, if this Higgs fields exist, it should have a quasiparticle excitation called the Higgs mode. And now we know the Higgs mode exists. It was discovered less than a decade ago at CERN. Higgs boson exists 125 GeV. And because of its existence, we take this view of a universe filled with a weak superfluid now as being, well, at least if not fully established, well on its way to becoming so. So that's the quasiparticle if, of this field. We understand it extremely well due to the brilliant work at CERN. Uh, the Higgs uh, quasiparticle, the Higgs boson, its mass, its decays, its cross sections, its couplings, they're all now understood with high precision. But it's an interesting fact that the Higgs field itself is still more or less an enigma. We have no instruments for measuring the Higgs field. We have no way to engage it and we don't know very much about it. It's a fundamental superfluid filling our universe. We believe it's uh, transition temperature to a non-superfluid state is around 10 to the 15 Kelvin, but that's all we know about it. 
So although we understand the quasi particles, we don't know much about the superfluid. Now let's think about superconductivity in the same context. context. So superconductivity was discovered by Heike Carmelionis in 1911 when he detected the disappearance of resistance to electrical flow or the appearance of infinite conductivity, perfectly displacionless electrical and electronic materials. Most uh, elemental conductors um, go superconducting. It's not an obscure phenomenon. It's an almost universal phenomenon. And that's because if you consider um, a fluid of fermions, each fermion's got a de Broglie-like momentum relationship to its uh, wave vector. Um, and if it's in a crystal, perhaps it's non-relativistic. So the energy goes as k squared, p squared over 2m but there are bands due to the crystalline periodicity. This whole beautiful structure of metals is unstable. It's unstable to the formation of electron pairs, pairs of opposite spin and opposite momentum. That instability makes a new ground state. The new ground state reorganizes the electronic structure of the material, not in a detailed way, but in a profound way. An electron pair system takes over. So these electron pairs, Leon Cooper originally solved this problem and showed that there are two particle quantum mechanical bound states. They have a real space component to the wave function and a spin component. If you work this through a representation of creation and annihilation operators, you can show that each Cooper pair can be represented by a sum CK dagger, uh, C minus K dagger, two creation operators for opposite momentum and spin. But this is just one pair. To make the new ground state, you have to make an electron pair field, a quantum field. And here's the BCS ansatz for that quantum field. It's a product state of all these pairs multiplied by these coherence factors, which deal with the Pauli exclusion principle. It's a fluid with enormous number of electron pairs forming a macroscopic quantum state. You could represent this state as London originally did as a macroscopic Schrodinger-like wave function with an amplitude which is the square root of the superfluid density so that the amplitude squared gives the density and a quantum phase. So this is an electron pair field, spin zero, charge minus two superfluid. This system has two components. One is that superfluid I just described to you and the other is the quasiparticle excitations from that superfluid. They're Bogolubov quasiparticles, they're quantum mechanical mixtures of electrons and holes at the same moment. But it's kind of a two component system. You have both the quasiparticles and the superfluid. Now we can visualize the quasiparticles by using spectroscopic imaging STM. We take, a, take an STM system with a sharp tip with a single atom on the end of the tip and bring it within an angstrom of the surface we want to visualize. Then apply a voltage between the sample and the tip, an electrical current, a tunnel current of single electrons will travel across this gap and can be measured by a current amplifier. So now we can measure current as a function of voltage in this junction. We can take the derivative decurrent de voltage, DIDV, and plot it as a function of the voltage V. And from theory, we know that's the density of states as a function of energy. Now in an STM, the DIDV as a function of V at a given location is the density of states as a function of energy at that same location. So on that basis, we can visualize the quasiparticles. Um, if you have a sufficiently stable STM as Perti described, so here's a lithium iron arsenide, each dot here is a lithium atom, these are impurity atoms. You can measure the DIDV spectrum at every atom and you end up with an atomically resolved ener energy resolved movie of the density of states. Here it is. This is the density of states resolved by energy and location in this uh, iron-based superconductor. And like all real materials, the density of states looks pretty horrible. The eigenstates are not real space eigenstates and there are impurities. But if you take the Fourier transform of that same movie, you get this movie. The wave vectors are beautifully well-ordered. And in fact, if you exit from the energy gap, you can see this contour here. It's 2KF of the Fermi surface of this material. So this is quasiparticle scattering interference viewed in reciprocal space. And this is density of states imaging, quasiparticle density of states imaging in real space. So 
quasi-particle visualization is now, has now in the last 10 or 20 years become a standard technique for studying many materials, including superconductors. However, superfluid visualization, visualizing the pair fluid is still an enigma, a challenge that we're working on now and an opportunity for the future. So to do that, we use scan Josephson tunneling microscopy. Now the concept is simple. If you have a conventional metal tip, it's only got single electron eigenstates in it. So if you measure the tunnel current, you're measuring as a function of location, you measure the location of single electron eigenstates in the material. On the other hand, if you have a superconducting tip, it's only got paired states in it. So it measures the location of the, the density of the pairs in the material. So that is, as a cartoon, that's nice. It's easy to say. In reality, it's a good deal more complicated. If you take two superconductors, each has its macroscopic quantum state. They have different phases, and they might have a voltage between them. Um, if you're a device person, then the circuit looks like this. You have a Josephson junction for tunneling pairs, a capacitance, because it's a real tunnel junction, and a resistance, which is dissipative external current source. So now, if the external current is less than the critical current of the Josephson junction, here's the DC Josephson equation. It says that if the current is less than this number, then the phase will evolve such that it satisfies this equation. The pair current is related to the maximum current through the phase difference between the two materials. On the other hand, if the current exceeds the critical current, uh, then you have to satisfy the second equation, Josephson's second equation, which is rate of change of quantum phase is related to voltage. If you integrate this equation, it says that the phase difference evolves in time according to this equation. So in this part of the curve, there's a current and a voltage. And if you travel out far enough, you get the slope is one over the normal state resistance. So that's the device characteristics of this junction. If you, um, if you want to figure out how much energy is stored in the Josephson effect, you can integrate current times voltage, that's power over time, that's energy, substitute these two equations, and uh, um, you, can, uh, you can remove the integral over time and replace it by an integral over phase. And then you get the Josephson energy goes as one minus cosine the phase difference. And the characteristic energy scale is h bar times the Josephson critical current over 2e. This is important. Now let's think about making a Josephson STM. You have a surface, it's got a superconducting wave function. You have a tip, got a superconducting wave function. So here's a model, two superconductors with a tunnel junction between them of thickness D. So Josephson showed that the current density traveling across this barrier goes as the sign of the phase difference. But how big is the current, the magnitude? Well, you can calculate the magnitude. He did, and so did Bardeen, and so did Feynman, several other people. You can calculate the magnitude. It goes as some constants. It goes as the product of the wave function amplitudes. And it goes as this exponential, this WKB factor having to do with tunneling through the barrier. As the barrier gets thicker, the current diminishes exponentially. Actually, this is one over the normal resistance also. As the barrier gets thicker, the normal resistance increases. So you can substitute here, multiply by the area and substitute up by the normal resistance. So their Josephson current by the normal resistance is just proportional to the product of the two wave functions. These are constants. And let's imagine that the wave function in the tip is a constant. That means if you square this function, I naught squared, R squared, it's proportional to the superfluid density in the sample, the thing you want to measure. So far, so good. But if you look at this equation quantitatively, you can use the ambergauer baratov equation. Current times resistance is energy pi times energy gap over 2e. So for a conventional superconductor, the energy gap might be 1 milli electron volt. So this product is 1.5 millivolts. But a typical, a typical junction resistance for STM is a gigaohm. So if this is a gigaohm, then the Josephson current is just a few picoamps. That means the Josephson energy is just a few nano electron volts. And that means you need to be below a temperature of a few tens of microkelvin for this idea to work. It's really, really difficult, if not impossible, to do this. However, there is a way out. Mother Nature has given us a, an escape hatch. If we write the equation for the quantum phase of this system, um, this is the equation of motion for the phase difference. 
Here's the capacitance, the resistance, the Josephson term, and the external current. Then it's equivalent to a potential energy for the junction as a function of phase that looks like this. DC Josephson effect is when the phase is fixed. AC Josephson effect is when the phase is continuously running down this curve. But suppose that the thermal randomness is so large that the phase is randomly jumping around. This would be the case for high temperatures. Then the, the pair current would be the Josephson current multiplied by some average over the sine of theta for the range of, for the fluctuating values of the phase. This problem was solved in the 1960s for high temperatures and capacitance going to zero. And the solution by Ivanchenko and Zilberman, who I'm going to refer to as IZ, is that the electron pair current I through this, uh, jump, through this junction here, even though the temperature is high, the electron pair current goes as this function. It goes as the Josephson current squared, a constant, which is the electromagnetic impedance, the applied voltage, VC is the voltage at which the pair current is a maximum. So that maximum is actually some constant times the Josephson current squared. Or if I take the derivative of this function with respect to V and then set V equal to zero, that's the zero bias conductance. It's also related to the maximum current or the Josephson current squared. What that means is that you can uh, measure the superfluid density in the sample by measuring the IZ maximum multiplied by the normal resistance squared or by, by measuring the conductance, the zero bias conductance maximum multiplied by the normal resistance squared. That's the basis of scan Josephson tunneling microscopy. Now it has taken some years to develop this technique. Many people have contributed. This is Xu Heng Pan. He showed how to make atomic resolution superconducting STM work at millikelvin temperatures. Here's Bob Dines. He showed that you could detect the IZ pair current although he had to go to very low junction resistances to do so, too low to make an image. Here's uh, Herman Suter, Suter, who not coincidentally is the chairman of this session. He combined these two techniques and showed how to image the Josephson current squared uh, by measuring the IZ peak as a function of location in a very beautiful experiment. Now in more recent years, it's become possible to image the superfluid density in copper-based high temperature superconductors, iron-based high temperature superconductors, and most recently in transition metal dicapogen ions. So let me just say, a uh, make a comment about, you know, what is the purpose of all this effort to visualize the superfluid condensate? Well, there's a number of things you could immediately think of which would be revealed by having such a microscope. So one is the FFLO state. Fuldefeller, Larkin, and Ovchinikov pointed out that if you can split the Fermi surface, spin up Fermi wave vector different than spin down Fermi wave vector, then if you make a Cooper pair, the, the sum of the two wave vectors doesn't add to zero, so the Cooper pair has momentum. When you make the condensate, uh, you have to make it with pairs which are oscillating in space, so you end up with a superconducting state whose pair amplitude oscillates in space, the FFLO state. And the superfluid density thereby also oscillates in space um, at half the wavelength. So this state has been searched for for many decades. This FFLO modulation has not yet been seen as far as I know. So another possibility is the one that Herman uh, was pursuing. You can image the superfluid density approaching an Abrakosov vortex core so we know that this is possible, but a quantitative work on this object really remains to be done. We would like to know how does the superfluid density evolve with radius, and we'd like to know how does the electrical current evolve with radius in such a core. Another possibility is that if you have a charge density wave and a superconductor, they should generate a pair density wave. If you have a charge density wave, something where the density of electrical charge is modulating in space, in the presence of superconductivity, then the interaction of these two order parameters in ginzburg landau predicts that the pair density, if the charge density is modulating with a certain wavelength, QC, wave vector QC, then the electron pair density should modulate with the same wavelength. So again, although this is a well-known homework problem for graduate students, the charge, the pair density modulation had never been seen. 
And finally, there's a strong coupling intertwined pair density wave, which should occur in doped insulators. This is a situation where the pair field modulates, the spin modulates, and the superfluid density should also modulate. This also is a challenge for this field. Okay, so let's just talk about two of those experiments as they're ongoing now. So first one is using scan Josephson to look at transition metal dichalcogenides. So TMDs are the hottest subject, one of the hottest subjects in condensed matter physics at the moment. They have amazing properties and an enormously wide variety of potential applications. So I can't comment on that in detail, except to say that they are an extremely important class of materials. But you can ask, you know, does a pair density wave exist? Do superfluid density modulations exist in TMDs? So there are many transition metal dichalcogenides where there are charge density waves and superconductors coexisting. Here's one, niobium disulfide. So if you want to find out if there's a pair density wave here, you need to use regular quasiparticle imaging. So this is the bias voltage. This is the differential conductance in this field of view. So here are conventional Landau quasiparticles. The charge density modulation is detected by measuring here at a voltage of tens of millivolts. Then you can zoom in into the one millivolt range. And this, sorry, I forgot to say, this is a niobium superconducting tip. You can zoom into the one millivolt range and see the superconducting energy gap. It is a superconductor. And then you can zoom down into the 100 microvolt range or below and see the IZ pair current signature. This is real data here. And see the maximum of the pair current. And if you take the derivative, you can see the maximum of the conductance due to the pair current. Um, so this is all done at a few hundred millikelvin. So if we image at high voltage, minus 20 millivolts in this field of view, we see the charge modulation. Now, actually, the junction resistance for tunneling is one over the conductance. So we can also image the junction resistance. And now if we zoom down to three or four orders of magnitude in the bias voltage, we can go down to the tens of microvolts range and image the peak in the differential conductance due to pair tunneling to the superconducting tip. This is the IZ uh, pair conductance. That's this field of view. So these are all the same field of view, but different experiments. But as I said, the superfluid density should be the product of the peak in the IZ conductance times the normal state resistance squared. Here's an image of the superfluid density of a transition metal dichalcogen. It's an extremely interesting image, actually. So let's examine in more detail. So here's a conventional image of the charge density wave, uh, or, or let's say of the charge density. And here's a new image of the electron pair density in the same field of view. So if we take the Fourier transform, we see these peaks and the same peaks here. They're the Bragg peaks of the crystal lattice. But you see there are six more peaks, they're here. These ones are the peaks due to the charge density wave. And these ones are the peaks due to the pair density wave. A completely different, these are two different states of matter, even though they're at the same wave vector. So now we can remove the crystal lattice from the picture and just see the charge density wave and the pair density wave simultaneously in the same field of view. This is really exciting and beautiful experiment, uh, which we enjoyed very much. This is an image of a pair density wave in a transition metal dichalcogenide. Now, you can ask, does, is this pair density wave induced as theory implies? So to test that out, you need to control the amplitude of the superfluid because it's supposedly induced by the superfluid, but the amplitude of the superfluid goes to zero inside a quantized vortex core. So by imaging the superfluid density from far away down, right down into the middle of a vortex core, we see the superfluid density diminish almost to zero and come back up again. But we're also imaging the pair modulation. You could see the little wiggle of the pair modulation on top of the signal here. So we can remove the background superfluid variation due to the vortex core. And we see that the pair modulation amplitude diminishes almost to zero in the center of the core, and then increases back again to its bulk value, which is around 4% uh, of, the, of the background superfluid. This is exactly what you would expect for a pair density wave induced by a charge density wave in a superconductor. So that's very satisfactory. More intriguing, 
if you look at the image of the pair density wave and the charge density wave simultaneously, they're not identical. So the SDM colleagues looking at this picture will see instantly that these images are quite different. But one of them was supposed to be induced by the other. So how can they be different? So to figure that out, we wanted to analyze the phase of the modulation. So first, we just focus on one pair of one charge density modulation. It's the one going in this direction. And one pair density modulation, it's the one going in this direction. And you know their modulations are some amplitude times cosine wave vector dot r. This is the wave vector. Um, plus some spatial shift in the phase due to the real space arrangements. And that's for the charge. And there's an equivalent equation for the pair field. The Q vectors are the same. So the only difference between these two modulations should be the spatial phase. Now I can show you the spatial phase. This is the spatial phase of the charge density wave. This is the spatial phase of the pair density wave. And as presented here, they look very, very similar. But to make them look similar, we had to subtract a phase of 2 pi from the measured phase of the pair density. Um, if I subtract the spatial phase of the, of the pair density wave from the charge density wave everywhere, it's peaked near 2 pi. And, and there are actually three modulations. We can do it for all modulations. It's sharply peaked near 2 pi. So what does that mean? There's a phase shift between the pair density wave and the charge density wave in this compound which is two pi over three. Okay, well, I can jump to the conclusion. Now we understand what this means. It means that in real space, the charge density wave, here are its maxima, and the pair density wave, here are its maxima, are always out of phase with each other by one unit set. This is an intriguing observation. I don't understand why they should be so. It's a challenge for our theory colleagues uh, to find out in the Hamiltonian of a coexisting charge density and pair density wave, is there a reason why they need to be shifted from each other by one unit set? Uh, nevertheless, um, and we continue to study the pair density wave in these compounds by using the same technique, but I don't have time to discuss in further detail. You can read about it in this preprint. Um, I'd like to, at this point, back up a little bit and just talk about the big picture. Uh, I asked, do pair density wave states exist in transition metal dichalcogenides? Well, the answer is definitely yes. They're as beautiful and more beautiful than we could have imagined them to be based on Ginzburg-Landau theory. So this is a very exciting development because as you all know, there are many transition metal dichalcogenides, dozens of them that are both superconducting and charge density waves. And all of those materials now uh, can be the subject of Josephson imaging studies to find out the real space structure of the electron pair field, a very exciting opportunity for abundant new physics in the future. All right, now in the last uh, 15 minutes or less, I'm going to change gears and talk about scan Josephson imaging of cuprate superconductors. This is a deep and difficult problem uh, of physics, which has gone unresolved now for more than three decades. So uh, the copper-based superconductors start out as MOT insulators. The crystal structure is CO2, so copper, oxygen, copper, oxygen. Uh, the copper atoms are in the 3D9 state with one electron in the dx squared minus y squared orbital. And the oxygen atoms are in the 2P6 state. They've closed their P shell, their base, to except for fluctuations, they're inert. So under those circumstances, and furthermore, the energy for two electrons to occupy each copper site is about three electron volts. This is the Coulomb energy to doubly occupy the copper site. It's enormous. So double occupation can never happen. And under those circumstances, the ground state is a Mott insulator. Now, because of hopping through the copper orbital, there's an exchange interaction called super exchange between adjacent spins. And that super exchange is antiferromagnetic in sign. So overall, this system should be an antiferromagnetic, a powerfully antiferromagnetic mod insulator. And that's exactly what it is. It's one of the most beautiful and robust spin a half antiferromagnets in nature. It's not a superconductor. Okay. Now, to make it a superconductor, you have to dope with holes. 
Now we need to acknowledge that it's actually not a MOT insulator, but a charge transfer insulator. That means that the two D bands, the lower the X squared minus Y squared orbital here, and the upper the X squared minus Y squared orbital, which is split by the Coulomb energy U, intervening between these two orbitals are the P orbitals of the oxygen atoms. That's just how the band structure works out. And the gap between the P orbital and the D orbital um, is not the Hubbard gap, it's the charge transfer gap. When you dope holes into this system, you're removing the highest energy electron. So you remove the electron from the oxygen atom and you make some quantum mechanical object, which is not fully understood, but which is delocalized. And as you introduce these quantum objects into the insulator, what happens is, so here is no holes. It's a robust antiferromagnetic mod insulator. As you increase the number of holes, the antiferromagnetic order disappears extremely quickly, leaving a new phase behind. This is called the pseudo gap phase. It should be called um, electronic dark matter because it's one of the most exotic phases in any electronic material, but unfortunately it's called a pseudo gap phase. In any case, this phase has been a mystery of physics for more than 30 years. What is it? Um, well, Phil Anderson's original proposal was that you know, you only have a small number of holes doped into the system and the super exchange energy is still enormous. It's many hundreds of Kelvin. So to minimize the magnetic energy, you would form singlets, spin zero singlets. And to make it into a conductor, you would dope the holes in. This fluid, which is a whole dope spin liquid, would then become a high temperature superconductor. That's a very elegant and fundamentally important proposal in physics. However, for this phase of the cube rates, it, there is a fly in the ointment. And that is that we know from a very wide variety of experiments that there's a broken symmetry in this phase. It breaks rotational symmetry globally and translational symmetry locally. We know that uh, among other things from quasi-particle in, in imaging by STM. So a, a plausible hypothesis is that the pseudo gap phase is a whole dope spin liquid which has a broken symmetry state. So I think that's a realistic uh, proposal for what this mysterious state is. So let's just ask, is that theoretically possible? Well, you can go to strong coupling theory. So this is not the theory of a Fermi liquid. This is a theory, a local theory in real space for hopping of very strongly correlated electrons in the presence of very strong antiferromagnetic interaction between each adjacent electron. Um, these guys are correlated because we have an additional operator here, which prevents two electrons from ever occupying one site. This is called the TJ model. You can solve the TJ model by a variety of approximations, and oftentimes the solution is a high temperature D-wave superconductor. But many times the solution is not. It's a state in which the pair field modulates in space, uh, simultaneously, the spin density modulates in space. Simultaneously, the charge density modulates in space. And simultaneously, the electron pair density modulates in space with half the wavelength of the modulation of the pair field. This is called an intertwined or strong coupling pair density wave state. And as you can see, it has been predicted by some of the leading theorists in this field over quite a number of decades. So uh, we made, uh, uh, Fujita sensei made a picture for us of what the state looks like. You would have a periodic modulation in the, in the electron pair formation. They're D symmetry. So they have one sign here, they go through zero. They have the opposite sign here, they go back through zero. And here's one period of the D symmetry pair density wave. And then here's one period of the spin density wave. And if I showed the charge density wave it would be even more complicated. So. Starting about five years ago, the theorists in this field began to ask the experimentalists, you know, does a strong coupling pair density wave state exist in cube rates? Well, that's an easy question to ask, but it was a very difficult question to answer. And the reason is there were no techniques for detecting a pair density wave. In fact, no pair, pair density waves had ever been detected directly. So to search for a pair density wave state in the pseudo gap phase of the cube rates, uh, we pursued an avenue, this is Mohammed Hamidi and Steve Edkin's work, we pursued an avenue of uh, making a high temperature superconducting tip by exfoliating a little piece of high temperature superconductor 
onto a tungsten tip. That gives us a D wave high temperature superconducting tip, which still has excellent atomic resolution. We're able to develop a recipe to do this. And it's also got a very high energy gap in the range of 25 millivolts. So now we have a high temperature superconducting tip with which we could do scan Josephson. We can see the IZ Josephson current, the maximum of the pair current, which goes as the Josephson critical current squared. We can see it growing as we push the superconducting tip in towards the surface. We can see the IZ uh, current, pair current growing. And here's its maximum value. The maximum value multiplied by the normal state junction resistance, which we deal with elsewhere, is related to the superfluid density in the sample. So uh, we were able to carry out these experiments at 50 millikelvin. The superconducting tip had a gap of 25 millivolts, which is wonderful. We had very good resolution in the nanometer range. The, jo the junction resistance had to be pushed into the 10 mega ohm ranges, which is difficult, and large field of view. So if we image this maximum uh, pair current as a function of location, so here's a topographic image. It's about uh, 75 nanometers squared. So a large field of view, but we actually have atomic resolution. If we image the IZ maximum pair current in that field of view, it looks like this. Uh, these were the first images of the pair field um, in a cuprate superconductor, and they're extremely interesting. Uh, one thing about them is they're pretty disordered, uh, but that had to do with the following fact. Uh, we needed to validate that this image actually is an image of the electron pair field. You know, when you make a new microscope and you show a picture, you need some way of validating that the picture represents what you see. So to validate that this picture is a picture of the pair field, we use the fact that from um, muon spin rotation experiments, it's very well known that if you substitute a zinc atom on the copper site in these materials, it completely destroys the superconductivity within about one nanometer. That's called the Swiss cheese model of the effect of the zinc atom. But it's known from USR that the superfluid density is destroyed at the zinc atoms. Uh, Isaki sensei our collaborator, substituted zinc atoms in these compounds. We can find them in quasiparticle imaging. Each dark spot here is a zinc atom. Every place where there's a zinc atom, there's a deep minimum in the Josephson current. So we're confident that this image is an image of the electron pair field. Therefore, by visualizing the superfluid density, we can take the Fourier transform and see that it's modulating quite coherently in two orthogonal directions. The wave vector of these modulations um, is 2 pi over 4 A naught, uh, which is a four unit cell modulation of the pair density in real space. So this was the detection of the cuprate pair density wave state. Now, what, what was actually going on in this image? Here's what we think. The pair density, uh, the pair field is modulating with an eight unit cell periodicity. That would cause the pair density to modulate with a four unit cell periodicity. We're measuring the pair density by the Josephson current, and that's what we believe exists in this picture. If this whole view was true, then of course you should be able to measure the energy gap modulating with eight unit cell periodicity. And our colleague uh, Fujita uh, sensei was able to do that. He imaged the energy gap modulating in, in single electron tunneling, not Josephson tunneling. He imaged the energy gap modulating, take the Fourier transform and show that there's an eight unit cell modulation in the superconducting energy gap. Furthermore, theorists had predict that if there is a pair density wave, there should be two charge density waves. One at the wave vector of the pair density wave and one at twice that wave vector. Steve Edkins was able to find exactly that effect uh, induced by a magnetic field in the vortex cores. So at the end of this series of experiments to the question, does strong coupling pair density wave state exist in the cuprates? We answer a definitive yes, it does. It's perfectly clear that there is a pair density wave in the pseudo gap phase here as it coexists with the superconductivity. And that, at least in my opinion, is a step in the right direction. Now, the 64 million or $64 billion question is, is the pseudo gap phase itself a pair density wave? If we knew the answer, if the answer to that question was yes, we would have identified all the phases in the phase diagram of the cuprates, and at least in the thermodynamic sense, solve the cuprate problem. 
Now, there's a great deal of evidence that the pseudo gap is a pair density wave. Um, the energy gap in momentum space of a pair density wave is a large gap near the zone phase and a metallic arc near the center of the Brion zone. And that's exactly what's detected in the cube rates. Um, the spectral function of a pair density wave is nothing like that of a charge density wave. The spectral function detected in the cube rates looks like that of a pair density wave. If you fold the band structure by a pair density wave and calculate the frequency of the quantum oscillations, as Mike Norman did, you get precisely the correct answer for the, what's observed experimentally. And finally, we know from many experiments that there are broken symmetries, uh, both uh, charge and pair in this phase, and they're detected by experimental apparatus. So, uh, there is a very strong preponderance of the evidence that the pseudogap phase is a pair density wave, but there is one fly in the ointment. Pair density waves formally are superconductors. They should transport electricity with no dissipation, and the pseudogap phase is not the superconductor. So the frontier of physics research right now is to find out whether the pseudogap phase is indeed a pair density wave, but one in which the phase rigidity is destroyed maybe by thermal fluctuations or maybe by quantum fluctuations. That's at the frontier of our field. We do not know the answer to that question at the moment. Okay, that brings me to the end of the scientific uh, portion of my talk. And again, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues who've worked on the Scan Josephson experiments and theories. Um, it's my privilege and honor to represent them here and to present their work to you. So I'm very grateful to the um, Lunasma Prize Committee, to Blue Force, and to the organizers of this conference for that opportunity. And on behalf of these colleagues, I thank you for it. And now I, I just want to say one thing about Lunasma. Perti actually said it on my behalf, but I want to say it myself. Um, only Lunasma was a great leader of physics. He did his PhD work in Oxford, actually, and then he went to Finland and built up what is definitely, uh, you know, has been for decades, the world's leading uh, research institute in low temperature physics. Um, he did that by focus on fundamental physics, by building, by inventing his own instruments, and by determination and vision. And of course, I admired that tremendously, tried to emulate it. It happens that when I started work with Rick, Richard Packard in Berkeley, uh, my lab mate was Jukka Pekola, who is now Professor Jukka Pekola at Aalto University in Finland. So Jukka is the one who, on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis, uh, patiently taught me how to do low temperature physics. So my point is that I learned how to do low temperature physics the Helsinki way, the Lunasma way, and that has been a tremendous advantage to me throughout my career. I'm extremely grateful for having had that training and opportunity. And I honor Ole Lunasma for his great leadership in low temperature physics. Um, thank you all very much for listening to this presentation. And uh, now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Goodbye. Thank you so much. So let's give uh, Shimus a great remote applause. So thank you so much. So uh, in principle, we had no time for questions. There is one question in the chat. Uh, maybe we can just continue and, uh, uh, or do you want to answer it as you want? Perti, what do you say? Would you... I, I think... Yeah, Perti. His microphone is off. Now. Can you speak now? Yes, now it works. I mean, you are a chairman, so you should decide. But uh, of course, for the audience, I think it would be very nice if Sam could really answer this question. Okay, so then please, Seamus. So it's a question by uh, Ramon Aguado. Maybe you're going to pop up and, uh, and place it. That will be the only question we will have. So what is the question? Ramon? Hello, yes. Uh, Hello. Thank you for, for the fantastic talk. Yeah, my question was about the, the best uh, energy, both energy and spatial resolution you can have these days 
and whether you can explore exotic pairing states like you mentioned the FF low, but also triplet and maybe some topological superconductors, vortices in topological superconductors, these low energy states and so on. So, so the spatial resolution of STMs now is extremely good. It's just a few picometers. Um, our, our record is near two picometers. Um, so that really is not a limit. You know, the, the Bohr, the Bohr um, orbit is 100 times as big as that. So in terms of visualizing electronic structure, that's not a huge limit at all. We can exceed that limit. The energy resolution limit at the moment is about 20 microelectron volts in a dilution fridge STM. In the next generation, it may even be better than that. It might go down as low as three microvolts. Um, so with respect to visualizing, um, let's say triplet superconductors, there's no technical reason why not, but all the candidates that we visualized, actually we usually find them to be S-wave or D-wave superconductors. So true triplet superconductors, except for liquid helium-3, are really quite rare in nature and hard to find. But these techniques can be used to discover, we hope, those characteristics in the future. Okay, so thank you so much. Oh, sorry, Ramon, is that okay? Yeah, sure, thank you. thank you. Okay, so thank you so much. So let's congratulate Simus again, and again, give a large applause. Thank you. Thank you. So now I hand over to the chairman of the closing session, who is, uh, of course, Maria Jose. Maria Jose, please. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Herman, and uh, congratulations again to Simus, and uh, also for the very nice talk. So um, I'm going to share my screen now because we are getting to a very important part of this conference, which is the poster prizes. Okay, so um, first of all, I want to thank the committee that have taken over this um, uh, this uh, uh, well uh, this role of uh, uh, looking at all the. Um, uh, all the posters in the in the uh, sorry on the posters in in the conference uh, there were a lot of them uh, so it was very hard work they told us it was very difficult for them to decide but we have a list of 10 uh, winners and i will start uh, telling uh, the names now so if you are in the audience please uh, uh, switch on your cameras so we can see you and later take a picture of all of you okay so we have uh, first, so they are all the same, basically. Uh, I mean, we are not making any difference between all of them because they're uh, all very good quality. So uh, the first one is uh, Pablo Bastante for uh, single molecule junctions, thermoelectric properties. So congratulations, Pablo. The next one is uh, Andres Puerto Vivar, nanoparticle structures on active uh, photovoltaic uh, lithium uh, neodymium O3 substrates for plasmonics. A duro uh, bicalegic but uh, for um, the work ultra thin uh, and NIBR on uh, gold 111. Uh, so, congratulations, Carlos Moya, for the crucial role of the uh, cobalt cations on the destabilization of collinear ferrite magnetism in, co in cobalt ferrite nanoparticles with tunable uh, structural defects. Congratulations to you as well. Sebastian Rieger for intrinsic exciton confinement in a quasi COG bismuth based alternative to late highlight perovskites. Congratulations. Uh, next is Jung Wai Shen uh, for the modulation of photocurrent by light wavelength and polarization on a ferroelectric hexagonal single crystal. Congratulations. Uh, we have also Victor Barrena for the vortex lattice imaging close to quantum critical point in the superconducting nictite, uh, barium, uh, iron, arsenic, uh, phosphide. And uh, Martina Corso for the band depopulation of graphene nanoribbons induced by chemical gating with uh, amino groups. Congratulations, Martina. Uh, next one is Padma Radhakrishnan. Uh, for uh, orbital engineering in um, oxide super lattices. 
And finally, uh, the 10th uh, uh, poster is uh, uh, by Tobias Wolf for a spontaneous by, uh, by spiral seen magnetically encapsulated twisted by graphene. So congratulations, all of you. Uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, to thank, uh, uh, to congratulate all of you with a big round of applause. <laughs> Only me, but <laughs> okay. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, and as I told you, if you're around, uh, let's uh, keep, uh, I mean, we can meet later for a, for a picture, okay? And uh, with this said, uh, I will uh, uh, give the floor to uh, uh, Herman Suderov, who is going to say a few words. Uh, and then uh, also uh, Jose Maria de Teresa and uh, K Professor Kees van der Beek uh, will, will talk. But first, uh, Herman, please, he's one of the co-chairs of the conference. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Well, I'm just going to share a few, uh, a few ideas which uh, which I've gathered together with you, and then uh, hand over to the to the to the EPS. So, so just uh, to put together what we have been doing, right? So, so when we started going going remote, right? Some colleagues argued that uh, that remote meetings are kind of uh, not true meetings, right? So, in short, it showed some dismay. They said, "Well, it's a pity that we cannot do it uh, remotely." Of course, one can argue that the threshold to attend is close to zero. There is no travel. There is no budget. And the budget seems less significant. And uh, yeah, that's great. Now you are going to be able to see yourself in photos. So uh, watch out, you will appear at some point. So, uh, so now, now when, we, when we have, as we have seen this week, we have seen people giving talks at 3 a.m. in the morning in Ohio and then run to the students. We have seen a, a rocketing numbers of participants in sessions. Uh, particularly in the inaugural sessions, but also in uh, other sessions, as for example this one, and in mini colloquia. And uh, we have seen very young students presenting their very first work as a poster and discussing with their peers. So we have seen the colleagues meet after the sessions, and uh, we have also had, had exhibitors who needed to, to try something uh, totally new for them, and they, they, they made the step further forward and they helped us using to organize uh, all this. So uh, I think that at the end of the day, we have uh, uh, learned how to use this experiment to improve our work and consider the thought of others and start new ideas and collaboration. So I think we have experienced the thrill of communication. So with more than 2000 participants, we have broken all records of attendance. So uh, actually, during the past eight or nine years, I have been the director of the Nicolás Cabrera Institute. So the physics in, in, in Spain or in, in Spain got a, got a big boost when Nicolás Cabrera arrived 50 years ago uh, from Virginia to Spain. So he brought a new wave of making uh, science that has impacted all over Spain, not just at the Autónoma. And I guess one of his dreams, I want to say that one of his dreams is possibly that, uh, that uh, he would like, have liked to see a large meeting in his field of research, which is condensed matter physics, of course, organized in Spain. And I think we have now come pretty close to realizing it. Of course, uh, in-person meetings are not to be replaced. So uh, you should not worry. We are going to organize paellas in Rioja wine and uh, seeing the Spanish sightseeing tours. And uh, we'll be very happy to host you again uh, uh, in in-person meetings. So, I, I chair a, a, a cost action where the motto is top science at top places. So this motto is only more stronger now. So in-person meeting will be much better prepared and focused on specific objectives uh, that require being in-person and be complemented by the online activity. So that's my guess. And uh, well, I think that uh, that's all more or less that I wanted to say. So uh, curiously, this will be the last address as the acting director of the Nicolás Cabrera Institute. And I find no better way to end my duties than being uh, proud of what has been accomplished during this week and uh, many, many thankful to all, much thankful to all of you. Maria Jose. Yeah, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Herman, for your address. And now I uh, give the floor for, uh, to uh, Jose Maria de Teresa. Thank you, Mar Maria Jose. Can you see my dog? <laughs> yes. yes, we can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 
so uh, let me introduce Dori, my dog. I'm going to tell a very short story. So in the morning, I used to walk my dog uh, around the neighborhood. And this morning, I was also doing this, uh, this walk. And then I was trying to find something to, to say the address today. And then I found something remarkable. So I found this wild plant here. So it's a two level, a two level plant because you see, so at some point is a, a thorny, a, a thorny plant with a thorny capsule here. But when it opens up, then you get something beautiful and soft. And then I, I got inspiration <laughs> because uh, this is like a life lesson. So from a, a thorny situation, you can always get something beautiful and, and soft. And this reminded me the, the CND 2020 Jefes Conference, because as you can imagine in, in May, uh, this was a thorny situation. We were really concerned that we could make it. But uh, I think uh, after these four months, we, we are coming to the end of the conference and we can say that uh, we have uh, been able to prepare a successful uh, conference. And I hope that it has met uh, your, your expectations. And if we have made some mistakes, please uh, ap apologize us. And uh, then my last slide is to thank uh, Kis van der Beek because, uh, okay, he has uh, done a great effort as uh, CND uh, board chair in the last years and his term is coming to, to an end. And I want to recognize that uh, he has been pushing very strongly these uh, CND conferences from the conference uh, he organized in Paris, the remarkable conference in 2014. And then later in Groningen in 2016, then Berlin 2018, and then in Spain in today. You, you have probably also received uh, his emails with the CND newsletter where he's put in a lot of information. And uh, I can tell you has been very effective contact with the different uh, sections of, uh, of the CND. So now Kis has been promoted to the EPS Executive uh, Committee and I will be uh, taking over the C CND board uh, chair in a few months. And I think there are uh, a few challenges in the CND community if you, we want to become stronger. And I can mention a couple of them. Uh, one of them, of course, is the conferences. Now we have to adapt to this uh, new situation with online or hybrid conferences. And the second is uh, effective communication ways because now uh, the background is uh, very noisy and we have uh, to read to highlight uh, the, the CND uh, activities. Okay, so I think we need you. Uh, we need you to become involved in all these activities. Uh, otherwise we cannot be successful. And I thank you for your participation in this conference and in the coming activities of uh, CND section. Okay, then I give the word back to Maria Jose. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Jose Maria. And now, uh, Yes, it's your turn. So please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, Jose Maria for your, uh, for your kind words. I am truly very appreciative of them. So CMD 2020 Gevers has been a first. It's been a unique experience. I dare say that it was an overwhelming success in all its aspects, even though that was not written at the start. Uh, well, we regret, of course, the social program. We regret Madrid. We regret the face-to-face -face meetings as colleagues. Nevertheless, the virtual format has, to my sense, been able to recreate fully a complete physics conference with all its aspects, with its dynamics, and, as we've heard from Herman, enhanced even participation to respect with what we are used to. I think that the success of CMD 2020 Jefes, this is due to the unrelenting, enthusiastic work of our colleagues of the uh, Spanish Matter Group Jefes and at the Universidad Autónoma de Madrid. In a few weeks, starting from the end of March, a completely new conference format had to be invented by them. In a couple of months, it was realized just from scratch. I am overwhelmed by the results. So on behalf of all of you and on behalf of the Matter Physics community, 
my deepest gratitude goes out to all of you closely involved in Spain, in particular to our three conference chairs, Maria Jose Calderon, Herman Sudro, and Jose Maria de Teresa. I offer them a very big hand and my sincerest thanks for a job fantastically well done. However, let's not forget that the success that we have today would have been absolutely impossible without your involvement, without the close involvement of all the mini colloquium organizers, and there are like 130 of you, of the invited speakers who were involved in the mutation to the online format. And this was essential uh, when taking decisions as to what we should actually do uh, in, with the pandemic here. I would also like to thank all the members of the uh, CMD 2020 Chefis Scientific Advisory Board for their guidance, for all the suggestions they made, which resulted in this fantastic program. Thank you so very much. All the members of the EPS CMD Board, thank you very much. You, I am extremely glad that Jose Maria will take over from me and I am full of confidence for the future. I also would like to warmly thank all the members of the Chefes Board for all their hard work in preparation and organizing the conference. Now CMD 2020 Chefes draws to a close, but its legacy will stay with us for the times to come. This was not only the first time that we had a fully online CMD and EPS conference, but resorting to this online technology has allowed all the presentations, those that were recorded, and discussions to be preserved. And you can find them. In principle, you can see the QR code on my right. Just flash it, and you will have the link to the conference YouTube channel, where you can not only relive the sessions, but you can listen to those events that you have missed and draw back on inspiration on all the proceedings of this meeting. I would also, in particular, and following the words of Jose Maria, like to draw your attention to the presentation of our condensed matter division of the European Physical Society, which can be found in the video recording of yesterday's General Assembly on this YouTube channel. In view of CMD 2020 Hefes's unprecedented number of participants, we all come away with the conviction that this conference and the choice to hold it online under these peculiar uh, circumstances is plebiscited by you as a community. There seems to be a need in these times for us as a pan-European condensed matter physics community to come together to hold this conference regularly as a recognizable and regularly recurring rendezvous on our agendas to find each other every year. This is why the condensed matter division of the EPS has taken the decision to return to the yearly frequency for its general conference, such as it was one day when I started physics in 1996. The next CMD conference, therefore, it will be CMD 29, a year from now, as you can see behind me, to be held from August 22nd till 28, 2021 in Manchester in the UK. Now the choice of Manchester, as it is a European center for condensed matter physics, and also in the context where we as a European community wants to stress and underline our strong ties and collaboration with condensed matter physics in the UK with all today's uncertainty, Manchester imposed itself. Evolution of the pandemic allowing, the format of CMD 29 will be on site or perhaps hybrid. We are still preparing. Preparations are well underway. What does that mean? As midi colloquium organizers, as members of the community out there, you may, as of next week, propose Mina Colloquia suggestions. The website will be open extremely soon on the IOP site, and the call will be sent out at large in the next week or so. So please save next year's dates in your agenda so we can meet again. I would like to thank all of you for your enthusiastic and lively participation for making CMD 2020 Hefes such a success. And I would say, See you next year. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Cass. Thank you very much. So uh, now I left for the last thing, the most important one, which are these people. These are the ones, I think most of them are there, probably one or two are missing, sorry. <laughs> but these are um, all the people who were the Zoom hosts. So they were um, behind all 
the meetings, making that everything was uh, working very well. So I want to say a big thank you to you all. And uh, it wouldn't have been possible without you. And well, I think this, um, I hope you you still uh, you, you still want to collaborate with us in the future and you didn't find it too hard. So, okay, well, I hope you have enjoyed. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. A big round of applause and for all the work this week and the week before. And, and okay, and with this, uh, I think that uh, we can uh, close. Uh, I would like to close CMD 2020 Jefes. Thank you very much for everyone. Thank you very much for your patience when the things were not going smoothly and uh, for all your uh, enthusiastic participation in all the uh, meetings and all the sessions. So thank you very much and see you next year. Bye-bye.